Radio for the Twilight Show with me, Adam Colbeck. Tonight we're going to get into all things ECT with someone coming to the end of that particular part of their teaching journey. We'll be reflecting, looking back, looking ahead and swapping stories. So sit back, call in, text in, tune in and above all, talk it out. This is Teachers Talk Radio and you are listening live. Tune in live at ttradio.org or to join in the conversation, download the Podbean app and search Teachers Talk Radio. Follow the hashtag TT Radio. Tune in, talk it out with Teachers Talk Radio. So yeah, tonight we're going to be delving into all things induction and, and the ECT. Uh, the ECT years. It's a difficult time for any teacher when you're when you're diving into a brand new job, teaching obviously probably even more so than, than a lot of education other jobs. I think with not, easy for you. Um, Where that we often meet accessibility. Oh, sorry, I'm just gonna Our subs- empowering education with. I think we're back. Um, as I was saying, yeah. So the ECT years are are not easy for anybody. Teaching as a as a as a job as an activity is one of the most cognitively demanding things that you can do. So it kind of sits aside from from any other job as well that that you might be sort of going into, um, you know, just just out of university. So it's not easy for people when they when they get started. And we've all anybody that's been teaching for any length of time will definitely have kind of horror stories that they'll be able to look back on and, and reflect on. And I'm sure we'll get the opportunity to share some of those with with my guests tonight as well. But induction into schools has changed quite a lot over over the last um, over the last kind of round of government, really. Um, back when I started, it was it was called the NQT year. It was just one year. Um, and now, obviously, we've got a two-year program, which I think overall is is probably a net benefit. I'm for someone who's who's a particular fan of the of the early career framework, and I think that the engagement that it forces people to have with cognitive science and what cognitive science looks like in action in the classroom is a positive thing to the for the profession. And I think it sets teachers up well for for the career that they that they then can uh, can go on to have. But there's no doubt that the demands on on ECTs are are probably as high as they've as they've ever been. I don't think I've ever met an ECT that hasn't been through that stage of wondering if it's really for them and wondering if they really can do it. And some of that's because of the fact that it's it's actually really difficult to know whether you are doing well or or whether you're not because teaching is one of those things that um, learning, in fact, is one of those things that's completely invisible. It's going on and happening inside the minds of pupils all of the time. So as teachers, to know whether you're doing a good job or not. You can never know that for absolutely certain. And that's why, you know, you've got to use use inferences about, about what you think children understand at any given point in, in the learning sequence to decide whether you think you're probably doing OK or not. And so that kind of lack of, of solid and, and secure definition around uh, around how well you're doing is it's difficult for any teacher and for someone early on in their career. Um, it really is challenging. And that's where the importance of your colleagues comes in as well. And it's one of the things that we're going to talk about tonight, the importance of of being in in a supportive environment at work and the difference that that makes to new teachers to have colleagues around them that they know they can go to for support and they can rely on and that they can kind of enter that sort of vulnerable space of not really knowing what to do next and know that people aren't going to judge them for that that they're just going to help them through it is really really important and that separates out some of the best experiences that ECTs have early in in, in the profession from the worst uh, from the worst experiences that they that they have as well so you've got all of those cognitive demands of going in and being a teacher. You've got all of the, the demands of actually going into to the world of work. If people have come directly from school to university and then and then back to work, uh, back to school, um, there, there's a demand there as well. And there's also then uh, the, the social challenge as well of, of slotting into to a new environment. People have already got established friendship groups and established ways of being. Walking into that staff room on day one as an ECT, it's probably one of the most daunting things that I can remember ever having to do um, within my career. So overall, it's it's a really difficult time. It's a challenging time. And it's something that's well worth our time considering how to navigate as successfully as we possibly can. So without any further ado, I'm going to bring in uh, my guest tonight, which is Megan Verney. Megan, can you hear us? Hello. I think I can. Hello. <laughs> that's that's always like my thing where, where when I unmute someone 
It's a and bit I think, of a can risk. they hear me? Are they going to drop out? It's like me and technology don't really go together particularly well. <laughs> so it's always a bit of a relief. Um, so, yeah, so Megan, you're, you're at the end of your of your ECT period. You've been teaching now for almost just coming up two years. But what's your what's your background story um, before then? How did you how did you kind of come to teaching? Were there other things that you were thinking about doing? Why on earth did you choose this? Um, so I honestly cannot believe I'm coming towards the end of the first two years. It honestly has flown by. Um, and I didn't ever see myself originally as a teacher. I um I went in to do a undergrad degree at Newcastle University and I, I went in and did something crazy which was food business marketing um the random wow, that's niche. degree <laughs> yeah really niche um i didn't think i was going to make it to university i really really butchered my a levels so i i did that for three years saw it through and then obviously covid hit towards the end of my undergrad degree and like most people my age moved home and had this massive existential crisis and thought what on earth am i going to do with this degree that I've got with the rest of my life, the whole world seems to be falling apart. Um, so I started working in my um, friend's mum's nursery just randomly. Um, and I thought, mm, I actually don't mind working with children. It's not the worst thing in the world. That's a good start. Um, that's like really <laughs> effusive praise for like, you know, anybody that's listening and thinking of going into teaching. The bar is, yeah. I actually don't mind too much working <laughs> with some children sometimes, kind of. <laughs> yeah, and I thought it's better than, well, for me personally, I, having done a degree in business, I thought I'm, I can't see myself doing business and making decisions in that way. Um, and I can't see myself sitting at a desk. I need to be a little bit more proactive than that. So um, during that year that I took out between my undergrad and doing my PGCE, I thought, well, I like working in a nursery. Let's take this one step further. And how can I possibly do that? I will look into teaching. Um, so I applied to um, three different um, PGCE courses. I think I did Newcastle, Norwich, and um, Manchester um, and ended up getting actually into all three of them and I um, chose Manchester in the end so spent a year up there um, studying to do my PGCA um, and and yeah and ended up again going all around the country with a job in London which is where I am now. Wow. So yeah, it's kind of taken you all, all over the country as well. Your, your, your teaching journey—that's pretty. Uh, that's pretty cool. Did you ever think about um, potentially doing secondary, or was it always primary? Um, I definitely considered secondary. I thought about maybe doing languages and Spanish, um, and there was obviously the incentive. I think when you go into um, secondary, they maybe offer a little bit of. Um, money money yeah money <laughs> <laughs> um which was at the time appealing for someone going through covid with no real job um but now i thought i've worked with like younger ages um so i, I preferred primary um i think that's definitely where my skill set lie um and having done it now it, i i hear stories of secondary school um and it definitely would not be for me yeah it's not for anybody for everybody i don't think yeah. it's not for anybody it is for some people <laughs> but it's not for everybody i worked in an all through for for, for five years and um mm. yeah completely different it's just a completely different um mindset i think teaching secondary to, to teaching primary and both have got their own both have got their own challenges and their own rewards as well but yeah it's it is uh it is a completely different beast and like w was there when you were kind of um going through your training was there was there anything about it that you were kind of like well yeah, I wasn't wasn't really expecting it to be like this often I was I was at um university earlier this week actually in um up in York and I was doing a couple of talks up there for some of their um for some of their secondary MFL trainees and some of them were saying that they were surprised when they started doing their their 
their training course that there was as much of an emphasis on things like cognitive science um, as what there was and they were kind of thinking that it would be more of a more of a kind of a social approach to to teaching and more rooted in kind of the the relationships and the pastoral side but they were actually surprised that there was as much cognitive science in there as as there was was there anything about your training that you uh, that, that you were surprised about um well i think because i'd gone from such a left field degree in business to then looking into teaching a bit more all of it was a bit of a shock to the system um but i what was good about manchester was they had quite a good balance of um practical in the classroom and also um you know the research side of things um out of that um oh i I, it feels like such a long time ago to take myself back there. Um, it's funny, I, hasn't it, how quickly it feels <laughs> like a million miles away? Yeah. I um, While I was training, I, I don't know if it's the same for every university, but I did two long placements and um, a shorter placement in a special needs unit as well. Um, and it was kind of luck of the draw. The first placement I ended up in mm. um, was so supportive i met such a lovely group of people there. still in contact with some of them today um and they were quite local to manchester and then the second long placement that i did um to round off the pgce um and i think this is maybe one of the downsides of doing a a pgce i stupidly admitted that um i had a car in manchester so they sent me to the farthest reaches of the catchment area and I had to <laughs> drive an hour to a placement school and back every single day during my second placement. Um, so that was that was insane. But again, it was a really lovely school and I think I got really lucky with both placements in terms of the support and the people that I met and the classes that I got. Because again, you hear scare stories of, you know, get people going into schools on their placements and they're not welcomed or they they don't really mm. or the school doesn't really I- accept them or or maybe even know that they're going to be joining the school until a few days before um so I, I was very fortunate with where i ended up in terms of that um yeah yeah fantastic it really can go one of two ways can't it when you're especially <laughs> when you're training it can some people go into schools in, in that as part of their training and get absolutely no support at all get abandoned in a classroom as the teacher goes off to go and catch up on their marking or whatever else it is that they do and it can really it can really turn people off and uh, before we go any further dear listener just to let you know that um i have got my my cat has infiltrated my uh, my recording room at the moment so if you do hear some stray meows it's not the, uh, the effects of Megan's ECT are taking their toll and she's just gone completely stir crazy and starting to meow. <laughs> it is a real cat, so don't be alarmed. Um, great. So, I mean, it's, it's great to hear kind of what your options were and, and what made you kind of um, choose teaching. And the fact that actually it's, it's quite refreshing, I think, to hear of somebody talk about the fact that they they like children and they liked working with children but not being like overly effusive about it and that was like it, it's something that I always kind of felt a little bit bad about in the early part of my career because I too do also really like children um, and I love working with children I love seeing the I love seeing the progress that they make but it's probably not my only driver for why I want to do what what I do and I think for, for me it's about being part of a, of a successful organization mm. and I actually like you know my role now I get to work a lot more with, with with the adults and with teachers and I like to I like to see the impact of of that on them as well and you know helping someone get better at something like teaching is incredibly rewarding but I think there's a lot of people that kind of go into it with this thing of oh I love children and that's why I'm here and and, and that's the only thing that I want to do and that is brilliant brilliant if you've got that but we shouldn't preclude people from going into the profession if if they're not as willing to be as effusive about their their kind of love of children as as others. Yeah, are. and I think what's been really interesting is I just assumed because where I done my undergrad, a lot of people that I was around were my age. That I think the common misconception was for me going into it that everyone would be in the same boat, we'd all be the same kind of age and. Some people had said, this is my lifelong passion to go into teaching ever since I was four years old and I stepped foot in a classroom myself, I wanted to be a teacher. And then you'd meet other people that said, well, you know, I I really like working with children and maybe more where kind of I've come from in in my standpoint. Um, And then also just how people have also had 
long careers before going into teaching you know i i know a few people that i work with now who um came from advertising or um i don't know i can't think of any other examples off the top of my head um but they are you know maybe would have been more mature students going into their pgce and some of them have found teaching you know at 40 50 60 later in life and it's not Mm. necessarily all um young people that are coming through although our school is i would say predominantly a younger cohort of um teachers yeah and it's 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 also the 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 reality nationwide as well so in the uk we've got the we've got one of the youngest average age of teaching populations of anywhere in the developed world so if you look at somewhere like italy it's it's quite high it's like average age like late 30s into 40s but in the uk it's 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 really really low so it, it is it is sort of you know the population of younger teachers to more experienced teachers is is kind of disproportionate but i think that the key thing and i think this is a piece of advice i think that you, you know i'll probably give to anybody coming into it particularly early on is talk to all of your colleagues about why they came into it because it will connect you with their purpose and that might make you rethink yours a bit as well and this idea of actually the purpose and the meaning that you get from doing the job of teaching is something that i think everybody does does appreciate whether your driver is just loving being in the presence of children or whether your driver is wanting to be part of a successful organisation, the meaning and purpose that you get from being part of an organisation that is in the business of education is something that kind of unites everybody in that sense. And, and that's definitely a, a positive. In the next section, I want to kind of dive, start to dive into some, uh, into some of the stories that you've got from your, from your ECT year. But before we get to that point, we're just going to hear a few words from our friends and sponsors. I'm like Empowering education with Easy For You, where innovation meets accessibility. Our subscription-based offering not only equips schools with cutting-edge devices, but revolutionizes the learning experience by eliminating financial barriers, streamlining support, and embracing technology. We're not just providing tools, We're shaping a future where every student can thrive, unburdened by limitations. Easy for you, transforming education, one device at a time. Find out more at www.easyforyou.school. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, publishers of professional development books and resources that support great teaching and learning in schools around the world. Don't miss out. Level up your professional development today and visit johncatbookshop.com to explore the full range of titles. Use the code JCTTR2425 for 20% off your order. Happy reading. Reading Solutions UK. Are you looking for best practices and innovative strategies to foster confident, lifelong readers? Join the free online international reading conference on the 11th, 12th and 13th of June. Hear from speakers like TV personality and education expert Basit Siddiqui, beloved children's author Michael Rosen, fluency expert Tim Rosinski, EEF specialist Chloe Butlin, the National Literacy Trust's Irene Picton, and a range of experienced practitioners, including MAT leaders, deputy heads, heads of English, high-level teaching assistants, and school librarians. Through the three-day conference, speakers will explore a range of topics at the forefront of the current educational landscape, with sessions relevant for all educators and key stages. Visit Reading Solutions at readingsolutionsuk.co.uk for more information and to sign up for this free conference. Hi teachers, we're Apps for Good and we give schools like yours free introductory computing courses. Our courses are for everyone, including those who aren't computing teachers, and they're fully equipped with resources mapped to the UK computing curriculum. Independent learning is central to our courses. Your students will develop essential and digital skills by working in teams to create prototype apps for good. We'll even connect you with industry volunteers to give real-world feedback. Let's empower every young person you teach to shape their future with technology. 
speak to us at www.appsforgood.org. Okay, welcome back, everybody. Now, for this next section, I want to kick off by asking Megan, what made you you pick your schools? So obviously, you've brought us up to the point so far where you've done your undergraduate degree, you weren't too sure what you wanted to do next, and you then kind of connected with this idea of, of being a teacher, went and got your PGCE, qualified, you travelled all over the country to Newcastle and Manchester, you're from Norwich originally, um, and then you got this job down in London. So what was it about that school that made you pick that school? Um, so I think when we were nearing the end of our PGCE, there was this kind of frantic rush, it felt like, I think when you're in the moment, for everyone to be finding a school to be put into. And, um, you know, some people had found their school by March and others had found it right up till the end, maybe June or July. And I was kind of somewhere in the middle of there, but I... I had a big decision to make whether I was going to stay in Manchester, go back home to Norwich. And a lot of my friends at the time were actually living in London. And I feel like at this age, it's kind of a pull towards, you know, living with your mates and and living in in the big city. Um, So I just randomly started applying to some schools, not really knowing what, what I wanted from a school, what I, you know, what, what I needed at the time um so i think i I fired off a load of applications i i think i actually ended up doing about four interviews in london so i used to have to come down from manchester during my teacher training um and do the interviews and go back up and receive rejection after rejection and it was just so disheartening and it was like what what am I possibly doing wrong that is not allowing me to get a job? You know, you think I've done the PGC, I've done all my assignments, I'm I'm putting in all this effort and I'm I'm trying my best. And why why am I not getting a job? Um so then I found um my current school, I think it was a Sunday night before going back to school on the Monday, and I thought, this one actually sounds really really good so I fired off this application at the 11th hour um and heard back I think literally the next day and they said that they wanted to take me forward to an interview so I was so excited got on the train to London and um I think another thing that I was worried about while applying is you hear that you need to take all this time to go and look around the schools and it's really good to get your name out there before you apply. And um, I hadn't done any of that because where I was applying in London, I just couldn't possibly make it work. Um, so I was I was really fortunate that they even gave my name a look in without having looked around the school before. Um, so I came, came down for interview um, and just walked in and got this amazing feeling about the place the head teacher who is spoiler now my current head teacher um was was really welcoming super friendly um they took me in to a year four classroom and I had to do a um teaching exercise I think we debated a book um or I think all the interviews kind of blur into one because it was such a chaotic time um and then they took me into um, the office to be interviewed by three of them. Um, and we actually kept on being interrupted every time I would go to give an answer. I think there must have been something going on with a child in the school at the time. Um, so then kept on losing my train of thought while they were asking me all these interview questions. Um, and I thought, Do you know what, this is probably going to be another another failure. I wasn't feeling particularly um like proud of myself and like I'd really done myself service in in my answers in in the um lesson that I'd I'd delivered um so I you know trudged back to Liverpool Street Station like oh great another another day that I've you know blown coming all this way um and just got off the tube all in a bit of a daze because I'm not from London didn't really know what I was doing um, and I get this call through and I was like, oh, OK, it's 5.30 in the evening. Who on earth is calling me? And it was the current head teacher saying, 
hello, um, we'd love to um, offer you the job. Um, what what do you say? And um, incredibly unprofessionally, um, I went, oh my God, shut up. Really, me, you want to offer me the job? <laughs> um, so I said, I'm so sorry. Can you just give me like 10 minutes to think about it? And, and um, please don't shut up in the meantime. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what I mean. Really, really unprofessionally. <laughs> I think just because I was so taken aback that someone had, you know, seen something in me and taken a chance on me. Um, mm. And I was just, yeah, absolutely beside myself. So I, I uh, did what anyone else would do. I rang my mum <laughs> and asked my mum for some advice. Um, and she just said, you have to go for it. Like you said how much you liked the school when you went in, how good it felt to be there. Um, you know, it's a massive move, but I, I think it's the right time. Go for it. So I rang my head teacher back and said, I am so sorry um, for the way I conducted myself 10 minutes ago. Um, I would like to <laughs> accept the job, please. And uh, she, without knowing, said, did you just ring your mum? And uh, I said, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, how did you know? And she said, I've got four children myself. That's just what they do. And I think even hearing her say that, and yeah. it just yeah. felt like in that moment, I've made the right decision. Like she, She's a she's so great um i can't speak more highly of her um obviously now now knowing her for two years um so yeah that's how I she's gonna probably listen to the podcast as well so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i i love her she's great <laughs> yeah you know i i'm obviously and full disclosure here so megan works at the same school as my wife and uh, and so I, I know i know your head teacher um a little bit as well and everybody that um that works for your head teacher um, raves about her and says how fantastic she is and I think there's a lesson there for, for for leaders as well or someone looking to go into leadership it's something that I get from from your head every time I talk to her is that she is like she treats people very much as people first and and teachers second or professionals second um, and that's that, that's such a great ethos to live by I think and it's really interesting to kind of hear you talk about the fact that there was something really intangible about the whole thing when you went to visit the school and the fact that it was just how it felt and, and how people treated you and the, the feel that you got from it and the fact that, you know, it's that kind of family and supportive feel that I think people value so much, especially when you're an ECT and even more so when you're when you're potentially moving away from home. And I think that's such a big thing for leaders to to be aware of when you're, especially when it's somebody who is straight out of university, who's who's not worked uh, previously to that you're giving someone their first job like you're inducting them not just into a school and into teaching but you're inducting them into the world of work as well and there's a massive responsibility that that comes with that and so yeah it's, it's great to hear um it's great to hear of, of a school that is so aware of and so conscious of that i also think there's a, a big thing there around um around how the interviews how your interview is conducted so essentially you went in, you taught a lesson, you went and sat in a room and had a conversation and were asked some key questions like, that's it, that's enough, that's an interview. It doesn't have to be anything anything more than that. And you see so often now, like people trying to be really, really clever and, and sort of, um, and you know, ingenious with these with different interview ideas. And I, so much of it just distracts from the fact that you just want to get to know that person. Yeah, I think, um, so I'm, sorry to interrupt. I think what I found okay. having done four or five interviews at that point is you you value the conversation with them so much more because i think someone once said to me you know you might be wanting the job and and they might be interviewing you but you are interviewing them as much as yeah. you, you know because you need to get a feel for the school you shouldn't just and i think in the moment i probably would have accepted anything um <laughs> but <laughs> you are also making this massive decision. Like you said, you know, I was uplifting my whole life to go for this job and this school and it, it had to be right. And I just got so lucky. And now in hindsight, you know, having been at the school and I think we'll probably touch on this in a bit, but knowing the ethos and the things that are in place, I would 100% if I was to do it again, know what to look for when I'm applying and I think when you're fresh out of this PGC you have you have no idea really what the school is about you don't really know what to look for um so yeah I, I just got ridiculously lucky with 
with where I ended up. Mm. And I think, you know, for, for people that are, there might be people who are um, ITT students at the moment looking for jobs. And I think the biggest piece of advice I could give people would be just to, to be picky. Like you don't have to jump at the first thing at the, at the time of talking. There are that there are plenty of jobs going around, and we have, which is a terrible thing. We have a, a retention crisis within within teaching, and we're losing a lot of experienced teachers by the day. And that's something we definitely need to do do more about because we're losing so much expertise from this profession. But if you're a student who's just about to qualify and you're coming into the profession now, you're in a really strong position. So you don't need to jump too too soon. I think it's really important to kind of um, to kind of acknowledge that when you when you started. And this is like a really, um, really sort of open question. I'm really interested to hear uh, your, your take on it. So did you feel like you were good when you started? Did you feel like you were ready when you walked into the classroom to start off with and felt like, yeah, I'm, I'm where I should probably be? I think the bit that hit home the most for me was I went in in July, I think, um, to do like the meet the teacher day. And so I teach year four. And so the year threes came up and I was for the first time properly alone in a classroom with these children, without a teaching assistant, without a mentor. And I was like, what, what do I do now? What, what happens, (laughs) what happens next? Um, (laughs) You know, I'm now like solely responsible for, for these children and, I think within the first few months, I mean, even now I sometimes struggle with it. Massive imposter syndrome, you know, why? And being a young teacher, yeah, it definitely has it. It's positive. But um, I I just think sometimes, you know, I'm probably in a closer, closer in age to some of the children than I am to potentially some of their parents. Mm. Um, And I do think, you know, it's, it's my own issue with the imposter syndrome, but also, unfortunately, you do get some people looking at you and thinking, are you old enough to teach my children? I've unfortunately had comments made towards me about whether I'm whether I'm old enough and how old am I? Um, mm-hmm. And I just, I just think it's completely unfair because, you know, you might have a 40 year old who's just gone and done their PGC training or a 24 year old who's just gone and done their PGC training. You know, you're both at exact same, exactly the same stage in your career and in terms of knowledge in the classroom, but just because they're a little bit older, they might be seen as having you know, more knowledge or, and it, it's not necessarily true. Um, yeah, for sure. So when I first joined it, it was all a bit like, ah, I don't, I don't feel like I know what I'm doing. You know, you can only, have so much preparation and you really are getting your hand held throughout the whole of the PGCE and even though you're teaching up to I think 80% it was it in my case at my university it it's not the same as when you first step into that classroom and you have to plan your own lessons and you have to deliver your own lessons and there's not going to be a mentor in the back of the classroom who can step in if if you're having a wobble or if if you're struggling to teach a concept you are the sole person responsible and it was definitely a shock to the system um but getting getting better definitely do feel like more of a commanding presence in the room which is good um the the imposter syndrome the the imposter syndrome never leaves you as well Mm. it really really never leaves you even now i'm 15 years in and if i go and teach a lesson especially if i'm like if i'm coaching a teacher and like we've agreed, okay, I'm going to come in and, and do some teaching in your class and we're going to look at this one particular thing. I feel more, it's not like crippling pressure, but, I, but I'm but i aware that I really want it to be valuable to that teacher. And it, and you do sort of even now like have that have that self-doubt around, right, can I really can I really give this person something? And it, it never leaves you, but I think it's a good thing. I think if you've if you've got that, I think that's what kind of brings out brings out the best in you as well and makes you kind of if you're continually questioning yourself unless you're doing it in in an unhealthy way and there's a balance to be struck for sure but if you're constantly questioning everything that you're doing and reflecting on everything that you're doing then you're also far more likely to to improve on it as well and so I think it's that imposter syndrome is probably something to be um to be embraced and uh it's interesting as well like 
that that imposter syndrome is definitely something that for me personally I've developed more as I've as I've gone through when I first started when I, I remember first going into the classroom I thought I had it absolutely locked down because I I kind of had like years of of growing up and like being pretty good with kids and having everybody going oh you should be a teacher you're so good with kids you know this is you're great you've got to go and be a teacher you'll be brilliant and I'd I'd, I'd sort of done pretty well at school or I don't okay at school myself um and you know, I'd enjoyed I'd enjoyed some teachers at school as well. So I kind of thought, well, if I sort of combine this thing of being good with kids, and, and I obviously thought I had loads of charisma and all that kind of thing. I've since been been told I don't, but that's okay. Um, and I'll combine that with um, with some of the stuff that my teachers did. Oh, I'm going to be brilliant. This is this is gonna this is going to be an absolute breeze. And it was a real shock for me when when I kind of got into my my as it was then my NQT year and I got like a term into it and it was going it was going terribly like really really terribly so much so that like the the head teacher of the school that I was working at was like well you know Adam we um like we think you're a nice guy we like you and you know we think you'll get there eventually but you're not there yet and um we've kind of got Ofsted coming and don't really want you hanging around when they're here and um and I left and it was and I remember like at that point thinking all right I've massively underestimated this and then from that point of view it was the best thing that happened to me because it 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 kind of showed me the value of that imposter syndrome and that sort of self-doubt that's that's actually a little bit healthy to have and as you've got to keep it in check you absolutely have to keep it in check and you've got to always make sure that you're um believing that you're good enough as well and certainly i think when you get through your your induction you have that that validation of right okay i'm good enough now and you know i'm going to get even better but if i never get any better than what i am now that is at least good enough for me to make a career out of this out of this teaching thing um so yeah i think although it can go too far it's it's a strength to have that Mm, i think what's really interesting as well is the the guidance and the knowledge around teaching is constantly changing um and even just within two years of being in the profession the way that we have been teaching and you know advice around behavior management has adapted and changed um and it you know it's always always you can learn more you can always do more you can stay for hours after school and perfect all of your lessons and read all of these articles um and i don't think there will ever be a perfect teacher but you can take little bits from the people that you observe and and what you experience throughout your time and and try to be the best but you're only human you can't you can't be like i said perfect um, so it's interesting yeah, to hear it. that you you got kind of the opposite of imposter syndrome right at the start, almost like overconfident and yeah. to dial it back and <laughs> be humbled a little bit. And then, you know, like you said, it's turned out for the better and, and helped your um, experience. I think that I think the school I was at recognised it as well. I think they were kind of that they, they gave me they basically said, you know, yeah, we, we want you to leave. But we're going to give you that. We're going to put the deputy head of the school into your classroom with you for the next four days, um, just to try and see if we can, you know, supercharge supercharge your, your your progress a little bit. And it was almost like a bit of a last ditch attempt for me, I think. But like, I got so much from those from those four days. But so much of it was because she just just tore absolute strips off me. And and not everybody needs that. And I'm not I'm not saying that that's the approach that, that leaders should take, like you absolutely shouldn't. But what leaders should do is, is, is shape their approach to people based on what that person needs at that time. And what I needed at that time was someone to give me a, a real reality yeah. check pretty quickly. Whereas I think if um, someone had done that to me, I would have been in absolute pieces. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a bit too emotional like, and a perfectionist. <laughs> But that's the skill of leadership, isn't it? It's like, you know, I'm not yeah. I'm not leading just I've got different parts of my personality as a leader. I'm talking about like the, the you know, an imaginary leader here rather than me per se. But, you know, as, as a leader, I've got different aspects of my personality. But and I'm going to select which aspect of my personality is best suited to deal with this particular situation that I'm in and, and to help this particular person that I'm with. And with this person, she had a side to her that was really, really straight down the line and no nonsense because she had this unwavering belief in kids deserving the absolute best. Um, and that's that's the side of her I needed. 
And then I remember you know, thinking back and I remember other people that she would be really different to. And it's like at the time you kind of, you can kind of mistake that as being like, oh, you know, she's a little bit, you know, disingenuous or whatever, but she's not. It's just both of that is her authentic or was her authentic self. It's just she knew what each different person needed um, to, to kind of stay motivated. So, and for me, it was about staying grounded as much as it was um, staying motivated. So, yeah, it was, a, it was an interesting experience nonetheless. And uh, yeah, gladly I came through it and I'm still still doing okay. Um, how important were your were your colleagues or how important are your colleagues in, you know, throughout the ECT period in particular? So when I joined my current school, um, they also took in two other ECTs. Um, and that was really, really good because it meant that, like I think you already said when you go into the staff room on the first day and it's kind of like being the new kid um, at school, um, yeah. you're still trying to figure it out. And, um, you know, where do I sit at lunchtime and who am I allowed to talk to? Is there a hierarchy of, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, friends here? Um, Microwave hierarchy. Was... That's what you want to be aware of. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it was so lovely to have been welcomed um by not only the staff but also to be able to bounce off the other new ECTs and feel like there's three of us in this same position we can go in together and if we're having a day where we're struggling um you know we can support each other through that and again what got I got so lucky with my school because not only is it a great school in terms of um, the ethos and the head teacher and all of that the colleagues that I work with you know we're quite a young staff um, in general so we are now able to socialize outside of school and we've we've got into kind of a nice pattern of going on a Friday to the to the pub and kind of decompressing after a after a difficult week um, and I, I think that's so important to work with people that you get on with and that they respect you and you respect them because it's such a challenging job. And if you didn't have that support network around you and people that obviously you've got your friends outside of work, but to have people that are going through the same as you yeah, and yeah. who can reflect on similar experiences it's invaluable you know it it really has made such a difference working with such amazing people um and not even just the teaching staff you know the teaching assistants um i'm very very fortunate this year to have two who work in um, across year four um and god i'd be lost without them <laughs> mm -hmm. you know and um colleagues really do make or break i think yeah. yeah definitely they, they certainly i think because because teaching is such a unique thing to do and the challenges are so unique it's so difficult to understand if you're not in it and so having people who kind of share that experience i mean the number of times you, you talk to about to, to people that don't do the job and and you are oh, i'm absolutely exhausted i've been working all weekend and, well, what are you doing all weekend you know you you're not teaching anybody and your job is a teacher. So what, what is that? Okay, you've got to plan your lessons. You might have to, to mark some books if your school wants you to do any written marking. Personally, I think if there's any schools out there still doing written marking, drop it quick. But anyway, each, each to their <laughs> own. Um, but like there is this thing of like what what should you what could you possibly be doing? So having people mm. that have kind of shared that experience with you is so, so important. And there's so much there's so much expertise to gain from it. And it's um, it, the time old. School, oh, sorry. No, no, go on, go on, go on. The, no, I was going to say the time old classic is when you go and see your friends who, who aren't teachers and they say, oh, you only work five weeks in the year because you've got all this summer holidays, Easter holidays, Christmas holidays, you know, you've got an easy life. Yeah. You finish finish at three when the kids leave and that's your job done. Yeah. And uh, that was you're laughing at the moment, yeah. <laughs> but obviously they don't see all the behind the scenes stuff that's going on and the prep that you do and I I hate to be you know Debbie Downer constantly because I'm not just gonna complain I, I chose this job I went into this profession knowing that it is hard work and you do have to love it but it is unfortunately comments like that that do grind your gears a little bit um and oh, I think uh, yeah are, are difficult to hear 
Um, obviously, they don't mean anything by it, but yeah, it is no, a challenge definitely. because you know you you maybe want to go out and enjoy your two days off on the weekend and it's like well i do actually need to factor in that maybe i need to write reports this weekend i need to fact that i've not planned a geography lesson for monday um so maybe shouldn't go too crazy yeah Yeah, that's it it's also like the, the stuff that people don't see is that it sits in your head all the time and i remember like i remember i used to, I used to be a tennis coach before as a, a teacher and a couple of people that i would i would coach who who were making a lot more money than i was and but they were also able just to leave it when when they left the left the building and whereas you can't really do that with teaching like this it's if you feel like a kid isn't learning something that you really need them to learn and that they need to know like it just plays on your mind over and over and over again and again there's a there's a, a positive to that because that's about that's part of what being reflective and responsive is um and you know, last week on the show, we we're talking about responsive teaching. With um, one of the things I was talking about with Carla Whelan, who I had on the show last week. But it, you, you've got to find the balance as well, and you you have got to be able to to kind of switch off. But that that professional community is is so important, as you say. And at, at my school at the moment, we've invested a lot over the last two and a half years to build a, a, an instructional coaching program that facilitates that. And so we're now at the point where everybody in the school is a coach and is also a coachee. And so because everybody plays both of those roles, it's really worked in terms of supercharging the culture of the school and making it about development and everybody understanding that each other are your best resource in terms of developing your teaching. So getting better at teaching becomes something that you enjoy doing and that is is, is quite a kind of in, enjoyable process because you're doing it in collaboration with a colleague rather than trying to evidence that you've got better at something because someone above mm-hmm. you in the hierarchy has told you you need to get better at it. Yeah. Like with the with the model that we've got, so if, I, if I'm coaching you, you're also coaching me. And we'll, we'll have a different focus because it's, it's always driven through what that individual needs. But it means that when I come in to, to coach you and, I, and I'm observing you, you're not feeling like I'm like I'm doing it to you because you know that the following week you're coming to watch me. And we're going to reverse those roles. And I just think that as as much as as much as leaders can do to try and create these these um, learning communities within schools, that's that's where they're, they're, a lot of leadership energy should be going. Because when you get it, it's so powerful. It makes people not only feel included and part of the community, but it, it does supercharge that culture from a development point of view. It makes everybody invest and enjoy getting better at their job rather than seeing getting better at their job as something they have to do to keep the wolves from the door. Yeah, we've um, been moving more towards that in our school as well. Um, And I think it definitely takes the pressure off, you know, being observed. That is the one thing that myself and I think all staff who, you know, there's teachers at our school have been teaching for 20, 25 years. And the one thing they say that breaks them every time is being observed. And so this new shift towards the instructional coaching is, you know, it it doesn't feel like this massive scary thing of you've got the head teacher coming in and she's going to say, you know, two stars and a wish, or she's going to, you know, really lay into you about something. It feels more of just a, a conversation and how can we all help each other? How can we all benefit each other? Not just for, bettering your own teaching but it it, realistically it is just to better your teaching for the children and how can you support the children better and it doesn't need to be this thing of do this do that and and that's that's all it's gonna be it's 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 because you've got in in that relationship as coach and teacher you've got the coach is bringing some expertise in terms of Mm. the the eyes that they've got on the room that you haven't got because you're thinking about your teaching but you as the teacher have contextual expertise that no one can can possibly have when they walk in to observe you and that's always when i started teaching like you know three three formal lesson observations a year was the absolute norm and it was it, it never worked it never had any impact because when whenever somebody would come in they'd go well you know instead of doing this you could have done this you know well yeah but you've got no idea about the context of this room and yeah because they've only seen like a snippet of 10 or 15 minutes and you don't know that um you know you've only just got the class settled or Mm. somebody's just you know 
had a had an issue or they you're right they just see this snippet and sometimes it feels a little unfair and you you spend so long prepping the perfect lesson to be observed and then it all just crumbles and goes wrong or they walk in at the wrong point that you didn't really want them to see because you'd worked really hard on on the 15 minutes that you thought they were gonna um get to experience um and it's, so it's, I definitely think the shift is better. And it's, it's, it's collaborative. Like you're co-constructing this thing with your coach. And like I always quote this particular conversation, but it was someone that I was coaching at the start of this year. And I've, he's now being coached by somebody else. But so one of the conversations we had, we were looking at, um, at, the, at trying to create a, a culture of error in the classroom. Um, and, um, you know, the suggestion that I had was, okay, so when, you know, so-and-so has made a mistake, what I want you to do is I want you to get, you know, let's get everybody to stop. You're going to give them 10 seconds to think. And then you're going to ask them to, to use partner talk to talk about and to discuss what it what the mistake was that that person had made. Then you're going to cold call a response from somebody. And then you're going to revisit the person that made the mistake. And so like we, we modeled it. We, he rehearsed it a couple of times, gave him feedback. And we just, just those constant modeling and rehearsal cycles. And then I, I asked him, like, OK, is there anything, any contextual adaptation that we need to make to it? And he went, yeah, absolutely. Like, it's just not going to work because, like, all of the kids in this class, like, if I pick on them when they've when they've made a mistake, where they're at right now emotionally is they they're just going to go to pieces. So he's like, well, and you know, perhaps what I could do instead is like I could model the mistake, like perfect. And that just that that little contextual bit of um, information from him took that strategy from being completely ineffective because it would have been ineffective if he had applied it into that context because because of that contextual uh, contextual nuance that existed there. And he took that strategy that wouldn't have worked and he turned it into something that would have worked because he's combining a, a good evidence-informed strategy with the context of, of that class. And you don't get that if you've got that kind of top-down approach to developing teachers, whereas if you if it's more collaborative... And it feels like you and me working together to kind of solve this learning problem together. You're going to get more of that. You're going to get the contextual adaptation, which is going to make any strategy that you're trying to implement so much more successful. When um, when we come back from this next break, I want to try and dive into the the real highlights and lowlights of your ECT year. And hopefully there'll be um, a couple of stories that we can, can pull out of you as well about your experience over the course of this year. But before we get to that, we're going to go back to our, our friends and partners for some messages. And we're also going to hear the news. Empowering education with Easy For You, where innovation meets accessibility. Our subscription-based offering not only equips schools with cutting-edge devices, but revolutionizes the learning experience by eliminating financial barriers, streamlining support, and embracing technology. We're not just providing tools. We're shaping a future where every student can thrive, unburdened by limitations. Easy for you. Transforming education. One device at a time. Find out more at www.easyforyou.school. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, publishers of professional development books and resources that support great teaching and learning in schools around the world. Don't miss out. Level up your professional development today and visit johncatbookshop.com to explore the full range of titles. Use the code JCTTR2425 for 20% off your order. Happy reading. Reading Solutions UK. Are you looking for best practices and innovative strategies to foster confident, lifelong readers? Join the free online international reading conference on the 11th, 12th and 13th of June. Hear from speakers like TV personality and education expert Basit Siddiqui, beloved children's author Michael Rosen, fluency expert Tim Rosinski, EEF specialist Chloe Butlin, the National Literacy Trust's Irene Picton, and a range of experienced practitioners, including MAT leaders, deputy heads, heads of English, high-level teaching assistants, and school librarians. Through the three-day conference, speakers will explore a range of topics at the forefront of the current educational landscape 
with sessions relevant for all educators and key stages. Visit Reading Solutions at readingsolutionsuk.co.uk for more information and to sign up for this free conference. Hi teachers, we're Apps for Good and we give schools like yours free introductory computing courses. Our courses are for everyone, including those who aren't computing teachers, and they're fully equipped with resources mapped to the UK computing curriculum. Independent learning is central to our courses. Your students will develop essential and digital skills by working in teams to create prototype apps for good. We'll even connect you with industry volunteers to give real-world feedback. Let's empower every young person you teach to shape their future with technology. Speak to us at www.appsforgood.org. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and this is Teachers Talk Radio News. The BBC features an article on teacher retention, with a piece leading with the headline, would a 1.40pm Friday finish stop teachers quitting? The article reports on troubling statistics which reveal that the number of empty teaching posts in England has more than doubled in the past three years, according to recent official figures. Whilst politicians have pointed to rising teacher numbers, some have acknowledged that government's figures also show that targets for recruiting teacher trainees have been missed for nine out of the ten previous years. This is despite raises to starting salaries. Teacher recruitment has featured in election campaigns, with Labour promising 6,500 more teachers and the Lib Dems also saying they would invest in more. Giving teachers an early finish on a Friday or a day off every other week have been amongst ideas schools themselves are considering. The article features comments from one former teacher who recently left the profession. She said in, rep in the report that leaving to protect her physical and mental health after experiencing anxiety had been the best decision she'd ever made, and that this was despite support being offered by her school. She was also overwhelmed by workload. Annual figures released by the Department for Education at the start of June cover the academic year 2023 to 24. They show that on top of rising vacancy rates, the proportion of state school teachers leaving the sector is at its highest since 2010, with 39,971 teachers leaving. This represents 8.8% of the workforce and does not include those who have retired or died. A report in May by the Education Select Committee said recruitment and retention was a persistent challenge. Early Friday finishes have been trialled by a school in London. Lessons begin at 9am and finish at 4pm Monday to Thursday, so no learning time is lost. The head teacher said the response from staff and students was positive and it had helped the school support well-being for all. Full details of the report can be found on the BBC News website. In Northern Ireland, the Belfast Telegraph reports on higher education. It says that students in Northern Ireland who are about to leave for higher education feel they have been left at a disadvantage when applying for university places in the Republic of Ireland. The Secondary Students' Union of Northern Ireland has raised concerns about what it calls double standards north of the border. This year, students in Northern Ireland are sitting A-levels with a full return to normality and no mitigations for COVID-19 in grade awarding. In contrast, the leaving certificate marking has not returned to normal since the pandemic. The union has called this unjust and said it disadvantages those in Northern Ireland competing for the same university places. SSUNI President Ellen Taylor said that structural barriers to Northern Irish students will deepen inequality and that the Irish government and Northern Irish ministers needed to work together to ensure young people's futures. The Guardian reports on a survey of children in the UK and Ireland which reveals that they are reading fewer books than they did last year. The 2024 What Kids Are Reading report surveyed more than 1.2 million pupils and showed a 4.4% decrease in the number of books read by pupils. According to the study, the decline in reading is particularly acute in secondary schools and affects the difficulty of books being read as well as the volume. 
The survey showed pupils read progressively more challenging books until year six, but after that, the difficulty level tended to plateau until year nine before a sharp drop in difficulty of books read by older secondary pupils. The research began in 2008, and this year is the first year there has been a decline in the numbers of books read, apart from during the first year of the pandemic. Explanations for the decline have included the drop in school attendance, with the number of pupils persistently absent increasing. Finally, the Washington Post features a story on Max the Cat, who has been given an honorary doctorate from the Vermont State University. The five-year-old tabby roams campus, socialises with students and even attends lectures. He also has his own staff email address. Having attended the campus for four years, he has been awarded the doctorate in honour of his work. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. Thanks, Joe. Doctorates and email addresses for cats. So that's where we're up to in education at the moment. So that's a lot. Um, OK, so uh, welcome back, everybody, and welcome back, Megan. Um, can we dive in now, Megan, to your worst day as an ECT? Let's go right in there with uh, with where it's most powerful. God, really put me on the spot there. Um, so I think when I got given the class that I'm in currently, um, I'd heard a few interesting stories beforehand um, and uh, they um, we know what's coming here <laughs> the teachers who had them previously kind of prepared me that they were going to be quite a difficult class I think there's a lot of um, behavioral need in there a lot of emotional support need um, and also just in terms of attainment levels I Covid is probably to blame for that there's a lot of children who are below in my class so to have gone from a class in my ECT one year that were on the whole quite smooth sailing I was massively thrown in the deep end in the second year um so to say that I've had one standout bad day is quite difficult because it all just kind of blurs into one crazy big I don't want to use the word mess of a year because it has been so rewarding and um like a massive learning curve for me but it has been really really challenging um and I think you know every every time I finish the day it's like oh my goodness did that day really just happen um <laughs> just yeah. sit in a in a dark room and decompress for about half an hour at the end of a day um but in terms of one stand up day I, I i think you know when when there's some children that are really having a bad day it kind of affects the dynamic of the class and if if one child is um we use zones of regulation at our school so if one child is in the red zone on on one day it really can trigger behavior from other children in the class and it's kind of like this ripple effect where if one child starts um finding something difficult um then another child is going to really really feel that um and i think you know i've i've had instances where um sometimes the behavior has become so distracting and sometimes quite dangerous in the classroom that um occasionally we've had to remove the children or remove the child and then it's quite challenging as a teacher because you see the look on all of these children's faces of you know what is what is happening at the moment to this child what is happening to us are we safe in the classroom um and I think those are the days where it's really hard, where you're being absolutely pushed to your limits in terms of what you can take emotionally and what you're seeing a child go through um, and you taking on that burden of how they're feeling and then trying to make sure that everyone in that classroom is, is safe is has probably one of, been one of the hardest things this year um, in terms of you know just mm. managing inside. And then just the quantity of work having to ensure that all of the children now okay i think last year 
across the board, we had quite a level playing field of attainment. And and this year, we've got some children working on almost a reception kind of level of curriculum mm. in a year four classroom, all the way up until, you know, some children who are baby pushing close to year five, year six level of attainment. So to cater for that in a classroom, um, while you've got all these other situations going on, really, really has been a lot. But like I said, I've, I've learned so much. And just in terms of scaffolding and adapting the learning for all of the children and how to best meet everyone's needs, um, I think, yeah, it, it's it's just been a bit of a crazy year. But I think next year hopefully i will get a slightly calmer classroom but <laughs> I is, think that, I is that a plea to your head teacher <laughs> yeah <laughs> hopefully she'll listen and uh <laughs> um, give me well I, I don't know i i i think it's been it's been really really good to experience um and that i'm gonna miss them when they go up and um yeah that's September. the thing you do don't you yeah, yeah. I, I can't believe it's already come to the end of the year. I think this year has gone so much faster than last year did. Um, you know, we were just having a conversation with my mentor the other day and we were saying, you know, it feels like yesterday that we were preparing the classroom and and now we're almost having to do it again. Um, mm. It is it is great when you can see, like, the challenges that you, that, that you face as, as something you can learn from. And it really, it really is. I mean, it, and for anybody that's sort of early on in their career and, and finding things hard, like the first time you experience anything new in teaching, it's all hard. But when you when you multiply that by the fact that it's also emotionally draining, particularly if there's if there are challenging behaviours there, it becomes you know it hurts you really, really. It really, really does each day. But but the learning that you take from that is uh, is is tenfold, and you it's it, it is honestly worth it. Um, and I think it's it, it you you kind of raise the point there about the importance of of being adaptive and, and responsive teaching and it's something we talked about recently on the show as well about the difference between kind of micro adaptations and, and macro adaptations and micro adaptations being you know I'm going to respond to what the children are showing me in the room at the moment so you know these five children don't understand these 25 do I'm going to send these 25 off to go and do that bit of independent practice and I'm going to keep these five back and I'm going to remodel and use some faded worked examples and all of the other strategies you've got in that toolbox but then there's also these macro adaptations that you've got to make to try and meet the the very precise and specific needs of particular pupils in in your class as well and that's really hard and I think one of the things that teachers find hardest about that is you feel like okay I've got a maths lesson now I've got to plan a math lesson for everybody that's that's at the level that, that I need them to be at. But then this child down here that's working at that reception level, I need to plan an entire math lesson for them and an entire math lesson for that person over there. But that's, that, that's not always the case. And I think sometimes it's helpful to reframe that and think, right, that child there, they will get as much out of concentrating hard on something for five minutes as they will from as, as everybody else will concentrating hard on something for, for 40 minutes. And so, you know, I was working with a teacher fairly, fairly recently. And we were saying, OK, so this child, this particular child, we're going to we're going to have we're going to work really hard with them for this five minute period of time. We're going to expect them to concentrate and, and really focus on this. And they, they've got some fairly severe um, learning difficulties, this child. But then as soon as that that little five minute period is done, they're going to go to the water tray. They're going to go to the sand tray. And, and the teacher at the time was like, well, isn't that? isn't that kind of a bit of a cop out? I'm just letting them go off and play. It's like, but, but you're not because what they don't have at that stage, which the other children do have, or a lot of the other children do have is the ability to self-regulate and make choices and decisions and problem solve. And mm. that's, that's every bit as important to that child as the math. So sending them off to the water trail, the sand tray isn't, isn't something you're doing just to, just to get them out of the way and let them go and play. You're allowing them to build up that self-regulatory thinking yeah. And allowing them to, to develop in a way that, that the others have already got. Yeah, I think I've got a very similar situation in my class at the moment where, you know, I was setting work, like you say, for I'd plan an English lesson and it would. What's quite disheartening sometimes is you spend about two hours planning this English lesson and you've scaffolded it across about four different age ranges 
and the English lesson only takes 45 minutes to teach. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was um, adapting learning for a child who, um, very similar to the one that you were just describing, he is working maybe at about a year one level. Um, and I was setting work that was maybe slightly easier than he can do and that he currently is working at. Um, yeah. But we were saying it's actually not important at the moment in terms of his learning goals to be really pushing himself and advancing in terms of what he can actually understand and is able to do. The goal for him is independence. Um, mm -hmm. And that's so much more important and crucial for his development at this stage, being able to sit there and focus for 15 minutes and be proud of what he can do by himself rather than can you do five times five for where he's at. That's it. And, and he's, he's coming on so well now, you know, it, it's really, mm -hmm. really been lovely to see. And he'll sit there and at the end of the lesson, you know, he's written three sentences that make sense. And at the start of the year, that would have never ever happened. The book would have gone flying across the classroom instead. Um, you know, it's it's that it's the little moments like that that really, really make you proud to be doing what you're doing. And you really can see, you know, maybe not lesson by lesson, but over the months, mm -hmm. it's like this this is where you're making a difference. This is why you do what you do. Um And that's it, it's it's matching your expectations of what they're doing to the purpose. And if the purpose is to develop independence and to build confidence, then giving them something that you know they can do independently and you know you're going to guarantee an almost 100% success rate, is that's a good reason to give them that, that piece of work. If you are trying to expand their understanding of something and, and you know maybe, maybe take them through a particular threshold concept, then yeah, you are going to have to challenge them. But you know that with someone like that, that that challenge has got to be really short, really sharp, and you've got to be on hand, ready to catch them if it if it if it doesn't go quite right. So again, it's just it's just making sure that you're you're devising tasks and devising lesson structures that are fit for the purpose that you're trying to meet for all of those children. But I think the key thing for anybody that's going through this, because a lot of people do, is that you don't have to feel like you've got to plan an hour's English lesson for four different levels. You you don't. It's match the activity and the task. And, and the learning experience in that lesson to the purpose that each of those each of those individual children children have got. Um, we're going to go to um, our final ad break in a moment. Just before I do, I had to share my my worst day ever as an ECT. You've kind of done a really beautiful thing there. You've kind of taken us from like your worst day into like some really lovely stuff, um, and that's really nice. Um, but when I was um, when I was an ECT, I already shared that I was I was I was a bad teacher. And I feel infinitely awful for the children that had to um, that were subjected to my teaching at that point in my career. But I would say definitely probably a, a high, well, a low light, but a highlight of that of that initial that first term of my ECT year was a um, a school trip, and we went to the uh, we went to the National Gallery, and I'd already kind of sensed that things were going not great, and so I was like, right, this is my time. I've got to absolutely prove that I can I can do this, right? So. So we got off the um, we got off the train um, at the train station. We walked to the gallery. Everything's going fine. I've got this brilliant session planned inside the gallery. I wasn't using a workshop or anything. I was going to do the whole thing myself. And I was like doing this talk um, about this painting. And I was like, you know, look this in this painting. That's you know, you can see these curtains here. They're like really they're made of velvet, right? Velvet's a really heavy material, and so that's been chosen by the artist to represent like the weight of this person's emotions and. You know, it's a really beautiful thing and the kids are getting it. It's brilliant. And my mentor's at the back and she's like making notes on this clipboard and like, that's going to be good. Um, and then like people start like leaving the the, um, the museum as well and like filing past me. And I'm like, this is going to be brilliant because now like, we're going to be able to spread out around the gallery a bit more because there's less people in here. This is great. And this um, this this member of museum staff came up to me and went, um, sorry, so have you been in, in room 42? I'm like, yeah, definitely. We've already been in that one. And I kind of thought she was making the link between the painting I was talking about and what there was in room 42. Um, so I was like, yeah, no, no, we've already been there. She goes, and, and do you have a black Nike bag? I was like, yeah, yeah, I do, I do. She goes, oh, you've left it in room 42 and we've had to evacuate the museum in case it was a bomb. So like, I had genuinely the entire National Gallery evacuated because I'd left, <laughs> I'd left my bag behind. 
and I like looked up at my mentor as she just sort of like looked down at her clipboard and like probably put this massive great big crash <laughs> through everything that she'd written that was good and positive to the but like the big thing with that I, w- I was talking to some students earlier this week about this is with things like that there's actually no harm done and that seems mad to say because it was a bomb scare and like that you know it, it's not a good thing of course but like no one was actually harmed no child was harmed um, it's fine didn't lose a child yeah exactly Exactly. And I, I think you do have to you do have to kind of be realistic and be kind to yourself when you make those kinds of mistakes as an ECT. And when you when you have those moments where you're like that was a complete disaster, as long as no one has genuinely been unsafe and as long as children are are learning stuff. The other the other mistakes are, are peripheral. My issue was that, the, you know, my sort of regular mistakes that I would make in the classroom at that stage in my career meant that kids were getting a bad deal inside the classroom. And so that was the stuff to to really worry about and to be conscious of um but you know there's the other stuff the stuff like having museums evacuated and that kind of thing (laughs) in the grand scheme of things it's okay so go easy on yourself that's it yeah very much it is very much a bump in the road i think Um, one of the biggest shocks for me was when i first started obviously i didn't really know london and i didn't really know um how to take a child on a school trip and i where i grew up in norwich you'd get on a coach and the coach would come to the school take you to your destination and bring you back all in one piece and then I remember sitting there in one of our first staff meetings in the first couple of weeks being at my new school and uh, they were going through these plans for us to go on a school trip to a concert venue Um, and I was like oh that sounds so lovely so what time does the coach pick us all up then and they said no no um you'll be going on um London transport said, okay, um, so I've got to take my 30 children on public transport by myself, well, not by myself, but with teaching assistants, and I have no idea how to navigate this at all. And uh, that was really like being thrown in the deep end straight away um, as an ECT. It's frightening stuff. <laughs> it's frightening stuff. Um, yeah. When we come back, we'll uh, we'll wrap up and just ask, ask Megan a lot. The last couple of questions that I've got, I'm sort of itching to ask her, but in the meantime, before we get to that, we'll just hear one final message from our friends and sponsors. Empowering education with Easy For You, where innovation meets accessibility. Our subscription-based offering not only equips schools with cutting-edge devices, but revolutionizes the learning experience by eliminating financial barriers, streamlining support, and embracing technology We're not just providing tools. We're shaping a future where every student can thrive, unburdened by limitations. Easy for you, transforming education, one device at a time. Find out more at www.easyforyou.school. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, publishers of professional development books and resources that support great teaching and learning in schools around the world. Don't miss out. Level up your professional development today and visit johncatbookshop.com to explore the full range of titles. Use the code JCTTR2425 for 20% off your order. Happy reading. Reading Solutions UK. Are you looking for best practices and innovative strategies to foster confident, lifelong readers? Join the free online international reading conference on the 11th, 12th and 13th of June. Hear from speakers like TV personality and education expert Basit Siddiqui, beloved children's author Michael Rosen, fluency expert Tim Rosinski, EEF specialist Chloe Butlin, the National Literacy Trust's Irene Picton, and a range of experienced practitioners, including MAT leaders, deputy heads, heads of English, high-level teaching assistants, and school librarians. Through the three-day conference, speakers will explore a range of topics at the forefront of the current educational landscape with sessions relevant for all educators and key stages. Visit Reading Solutions at readingsolutionsuk.co.uk for more information and to sign up for this free conference. Hi teachers, we're Apps for Good. 
and we give schools like yours free introductory computing courses. Our courses are for everyone, including those who aren't computing teachers, and they're fully equipped with resources mapped to the UK computing curriculum. Independent learning is central to our courses. Your students will develop essential and digital skills by working in teams to create prototype apps for good. We'll even connect you with industry volunteers to give real-world feedback. Let's empower every young person you teach to shape their future with technology. Speak to us at www.appsforgood.org. Okay, welcome back. So for this, this last section, I want to kick off with a bit of a nod to probably one of the most important people in Megan's life over the last couple of years, I would have thought, which is her mentor. So Megan, I want two questions to throw at you at once, if that's all right. So how important is your mentor as an ECT and what makes a really great mentor? Oh, okay. So um, I actually started with a different mentor when I first joined the school. Um, he was the year six teacher and he was really, really great. And obviously now still friends with him and all, but um, he was teaching SATs at the same time as trying to be my mentor. And he was maths lead and he just had way too much on his plate um so was really trying his best to support me but he felt like he couldn't do that so um offloaded me nicest possible way to say it um offloaded me onto um another lady who works at the school um who already had another ect under her wing um and she actually has not been in the profession for a ridiculously long length of time um she used to work in business beforehand but regardless of that she's got such a plethora of knowledge that she is insanely helpful um so she comes in and observes me uh, every wednesday um still getting used to the fact that someone comes into my classroom it still makes me very very nervous um but she just sits in for about 15 minutes watches a lesson um goes away and then we have a little catch up on a thursday evening whether it's about feedback or things that um i feel that i need to work on any advice that i'm looking for um and then kind of linking it to the instructional coaching that we were talking about before um we've been moving more towards that in our mentor um, meetings so we will pick a page from um i don't know if you've heard of them the teacher walkthroughs books so we're going to be careful with uh just going to move that one on just the mention of uh some sponsored content sorry no, it's okay. <laughs> um we so we use these um things and um <laughs> 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 done. Very smoothly done. <laughs> and um they we just kind of talk through basically a learning point that i feel that i need um to work on and the next time she comes to observe so whether it's the way that i feel i maybe need to use my voice in the classroom um because i have a tendency to when the kids go loud i go louder and it seems like this kind of shouting match particularly as <laughs> the uh um day goes on um, I end up losing my voice. Um, so I think that was one of the things we've looked at more recently is how can I best use maybe some more actions or change my voice a little bit to engage them, um, you know, talking loud sometimes and really quietly sometimes. Um, I heard that a teacher in the school got really, really good feedback. Apparently all she'd done was kind of mime something with her hands and all of the children knew exactly what she meant and in silence went away and did the activity um and i was like that is um <laughs> that is unheard of in my classroom um but no she is such an asset not only to me but to the school she um she is so helpful and she's just there not only as a mentor but just as a support in general you know if I've ever got an issue I can go to her um you know I 
I owe her a lot and she's she just has a lot of time for me and for the children and she she really really cares and wants me to do well everyone to do well um so I honestly could not thank her enough for what what she supports me with um the big thing there that comes out that comes back to what you were saying about your head earlier as well it's you know mm. leaders have got to remember that people are people first and, and professional second and uh, sounds like your mentors absolutely nailed that and I think a big thing for a successful mentor is being able to be there yes in terms of your like the instructional advice that you can give to you can give to your ECT and yeah the core business of what you're there for is to make them better at teaching but also you've got to be there as that as that support as well and you've got a, a huge pastoral role to play as a as a mentor and it's it's a difficult role to play but if you get it right you make a huge difference to, to people coming into the profession okay so just to wrap up then, Megan, what, let's look ahead. So what would you love to be doing next year? Do you know what you're mm. doing next year in terms of subject leadership and year groups? And what do you want to do further ahead into the future? Where do you see yourself going? It's a very, very scary prospect. Um, so we actually haven't been told officially where we're going next year. There's kind of been a few little gossips of, of where we might end up. Gossip um, in school. Oh, <laughs> I know, shock. <laughs> um, but I think what they're hoping to do is where we're having a bit of a change around in terms of planning and improving it post Ofsted and just in general, like the school improvement plan. I think the aim is to keep everyone, fingers crossed, in the same year. And that would be absolutely lovely so that we can, you know, use as much planning as possible that we've worked so hard on for the last year, you know it kind of takes the element of um that out of the equation and you can just really focus on the children that are coming up their needs um and you know it completely avoids you having to spend hours and hours learning this new curriculum and how best you're going to deliver it um so yeah i think fingers crossed it'll be another year in year four um and then post that I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> um, I think having gone into teaching and now I will be officially qualified in, well, I guess almost a month. Um, yeah. The beauty of it is that you can take it anywhere. Um, when I've been speaking to people recently and I do know of people who read already who have gone abroad with it, um, and whether that's something that I maybe want to look into for um, after next year, possibly, mm. um, you know, it's 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 all just so up in the up in the air. Um, mm. I this the scary thing as well is you know if you leave where you currently are, you know, is the grass going to be greener? Yeah. I think that's that's a massive risk. You know, I've like I said, I'm so fortunate to have found where I am and a school that I really, really align with. And I love the people I work with and I wouldn't want to leave all that behind and find a school that I don't feel the same in. You know, the bar is so high now. Yeah. yeah. Um, when you've had such a positive experience, for sure. Well, and yeah. You know, it's like you say, the grass isn't always green. And I think it's sometimes it is it is there's a, a massive value in in like staying and enjoying what you've currently got rather than looking always for the, you know, for the next thing. Although at the same time, there's, there's loads of, like say loads of amazing opportunities out there and particularly like the opportunity to travel and get out there. You can go anywhere in the world, you know, go to Colombia if you want to. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, there's loads of opportunities there. Um, and it's just like you say, finding, finding the right one. What about the like far into the future? Can you do, do you do you see yourself like going into any kind of leadership? Are there particular subjects that you'd like to lead, or or are you very much just kind of thinking, I want to be in this classroom for for the next forty years? I think the thing that worries me about going into leadership, and I know it's not the same for everyone, but I would miss the hands-on experience in actually working day in day out in the classroom. I think that's the part of the job that I really really enjoy. And if I was to go into leadership you know, would it be more based, you know, in an office or doing a bit more paperwork? And I just can't see myself loving that. Um, part of me thinks maybe I would go back and train and maybe go down the more 
psychological route looking into child psychology seeing if I could do something with that but for now I'm I'm very happy with sticking in the classroom um and I know you mentioned am I going to get a subject lead next year again I've not been told anything don't know please don't lump me with computing or something (laughs) like that because I will hate it (laughs) um maybe go for a bit of spanish or something like that Ooh, yeah. nice <laughs> yeah but in terms of that it's it's all still up and up in the air i think they're trying to figure it out at the moment there's just always a lot of comings and goings in schools isn't there um oh, so, so there might so. be a bit and and i think as much as like as much as I, I love leadership like the classroom is absolutely where it's at and um yeah stay, stay in that classroom as long as you as long as you possibly can and even if you do move into leadership at some point in the future still stay as connected to the classroom as you uh, as you possibly can megan thank you so much for for that this evening it's been it's been really interesting to talk to someone who's kind of at that at that juncture in their career where they're about mm-hmm. to finish their their induction period and i'm sure that'll be super interesting for people to to listen back to as well as as those that have managed to listen live with us tonight as well so thank you so much for all of the insight that you've given yeah, um, thank you so much for having me on. Oh, my pleasure, my pleasure. And um, we'll hopefully <laughs> speak again soon. Yeah, definitely. Um, for those of you that are listening on listening live on, on Teachers Talk Radio, next up uh, this evening, we've got The Late Late Show with Toby Doncaster. So do please stick around for that and, and listen to what Toby's got in store for you this evening. Uh, and otherwise, I will see you again next Monday night with another guest here on Teachers Talk Radio. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.